Hello. So uh, some of my friends like to tell me that uh, scientists are people who take the most beautiful parts of reality and turn them into squiggly lines. And hopefully you'll understand soon that if you understand these squiggly lines, they can reveal to you a part of the universe that's even more beautiful than your human eyes can see. If you didn't know what a fingerprint was when you first saw it, you'd look at it and you'd think, ah, oh, scientists are at it again. But if you understand that it's an identity of a human being, that it encapsulates the scientific agenda of identifying humans, then you can't help but ask yourself, who is this person, where do they come from in, in Lebanon, what language do they speak? So that's why Neil deGrasse Tyson likes to say, when you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you, and that understanding empowers you to give you new understanding of how to look at the universe. My partner is a professor of physics here at LAU, and the greatest compliment she ever got from a student was, I can never ride in an elevator the same way after taking your class. When they go down in an elevator, they feel that momentary weightlessness. Instead of brushing it off, they know what's happening. When they drive in a car and they turn a corner, they feel a torque on themselves. They don't have to say the words moving reference frame or relativistic motion to know that some of those squiggly lines gave them a, a new understanding of the world around them beyond their eyes. When I look at squiggly lines for the most part, I'm looking at ones from exoplanet atmospheres. Exoplanets are planets that orbit stars hundreds of light years away, outside of our solar system. We know of several thousand of them, but we can understand that there are millions nearby. And each of these exoplanets is unique. Some of them are as big as Jupiter, bigger than Jupiter. Some of them are smaller than the Earth. And knowing what they're made of is helping us understand how we got here, because looking out into space is a way to understand how we got here. We want to understand how our planet formed, so we go and look at how thousands of other Earths formed. We want to understand how our Jupiter is made of, so we go and look at how thousands of other Jupiters are made of. And we always ask the question, very egotistical, does it look like our Jupiter? Does it look like our Earth? And especially with the Earths, with every habitable Earth in the entire universe may look completely differently. They may have red vegetables, green seas, or be completely desert barren, even though scientifically they're allowed to sustain water, they may not. So let me show you a collection here. This is about 85 different hot Jupiters. These are all Jupiter-sized objects, and this is what they would look like if you were magically in your alien spacecraft looking out the window with your human eyes. There's red ones and blue ones and yellow ones and white ones, but none of them look like our Jupiter. The difference is, if you were to stick a probe in the atmosphere and ask not what does it look like, but what is it made of, you'd realize it behaves like our Jupiter. And so this comes back to the, a quote from Carl Sagan that said, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. We are made of star stuff. We are part of the universe. And so looking out into the space, it's like a scientist in her laboratory looking through the microscope and instead finding that she's actually studying herself. And so we want to go out there and understand what's, what's beyond our solar system. And because we're so centrally human located, we want to ask ourselves, what do we have first? We want to compare it back to who we are. So here I'm showing you three different views of the three major categories of planets in our solar system, Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter. That's small, medium, and large. And if you look at a planet, you're actually seeing its atmosphere you almost never can understand its surface. So the atmospheres of these planets is what you would see from outside, your, from your spaceship. If you look, Earth's atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, and 1% other stuff, water, methane, carbon dioxide. If you look at Neptune, it's primarily hydrogen and helium. But in fact, there's a little bit of methane, a little bit of ammonia, all that stuff's in the small numbers. And worse than that, if you look at Jupiter, the biggest big planet we have in our solar system, it's 99% hydrogen and helium. All of those colors, all, all of those stripes, all of that dynamic, the big red spot, all of it is less than 1% of the material. And understanding that going out into space is what helps us understand how to relate it back to who we are. But if we do that, we also have to remember we have two Earths in our solar system. We should look at Venus. 
Venus has 97% CO2 in its atmosphere. There's a little bit of nitrogen, and those clouds are made of sulfur. And so if we were 100 light years away, even with a fairy tale technology deep into the future, about 50 years, we could not tell the difference between Earth and Venus from our telescopes. Our human technology may not be able to do this for 30 to 50 years. And so when we look out into space and we try to say, does it look like Earth? Is it habitable? We have to remember that Venus looks habitable from far away. I want to come back and teach you, well, how do we know all of this stuff about these other planets? So here I'm showing you a video from NASA's uh, uh, satellites orbiting the sun of Venus transiting its host star. It's, we call it the sun, but it's just a host star. And the idea is that the size of the planet can be inferred from how much of the black dot is, is blocking out the sun behind it. And so that's called the transit, and the transit depth is the amount of light blocked out by the sun, by the planet from the sun. The other thing you'll immediately notice is the star, our sun, looks very different in each color. In yellow, it's quiescent, in red, it's tumultuous, and in blue, it's divergent, because you're seeing the magnetic fields. From far away, exoplanets look, you cannot see the planet or the star, most of them, but you can just see a dot, a few pixels on a, on a camera. That's it. And over time, at just the right moment, those pixels get a little bit fainter. And they go back up to being normal. When the planet passes in front of the star, the amount of light blocked is what's telling us about the, the planet. And the other thing you should see, you see here, you cannot see the atmosphere of Venus. This is right next door. And it's an Earth-sized planet, and we cannot see anything on the rim of that, that planet. We don't visually understand the atmosphere because it's so thin. We can only infer it from, the, from the, the cameras. When a planet passes in front of its host star, different light behaves differently passing through it. Blue light scatters away, and we almost never see it physically from our detectors. In this picture, yellow light comes passes through efficiently, and red light passes through inefficiently. And the idea is that the molecules in the atmosphere are actually holding back or scattering away some of that light. And that's how we tell the signature of an exoplanet. This is just the fingerprint. These three bands together is just a fingerprint of an exoplanet. Let me show you what that looks like in time. When a planet passes in front of its host star, this is a very similar simulation to the Venus I showed you before. If it's in red, green, and blue, just different colors, you'll see here that the blue lines and the green line dipped further down than the red line, about half as much the red line. What that means is more red light is passing through and less blue light and green light are passing through. If there was no atmosphere, all three lines would be perfectly identical. And so what this tells us, this is the fingerprint that there is an atmosphere. We don't know what it's made of yet. But it also tells us that from edge on, AKA during sunset, this planet has a red atmosphere. So when I look at these squiggly lines, I see the beauty of a sunset on a foreign world hundreds of light years away. And that tells us that there's more to find. But to do that, we have to have more colors. And so here you'll see each one of these black dots represents a color. This is a scientific representation. And all I want you to know is that in the middle is higher than on the, on the edges. There's a bump in the middle and a trough on the edges. And what that tells you, what we know because of the exact type of colors they are and the temperature of the planet, that this is ex exactly what water vapor looks like on a Neptune-sized planet about, at about 1,000 kel Kelvin Celsius. And so the idea is that we can now say we've detected water on a small planet. Neptune is half the size, less than half the size of Jupiter. And this actually is so difficult to do, it's only been done two to three times in the history of humanity, and this was the first time. This is a beautiful everything. It, it really remarkably changed the field at the time, back in 2014. But it's just one fingerprint, a beautiful, colorful fingerprint that tells us a lot about the atmosphere and this is all the, the best that Hubble can do for the molecular universe to understand ob what the atmospheres are made of. But it's as though you were looking for somebody, and they were lost, and you found a fingerprint, and you were only able to detect thumbs and not pinkies, ever. You couldn't know when they were there, how they got there, where they went, or what they had for breakfast. And so the idea is that we need more fingerprints. And to do that, we need bigger telescopes. 
So the future mission coming up is called the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2021. Hubble is about two and a half meters wide. James Webb is six and a half meters wide. Hubble's uh, mirrors are aluminum. James Webb's are gold. Every one of those hexagons is covered in about the same amount of gold as an average wedding ring. It's okay, the scientists work too much, they don't need them. <laughs> so th the idea though is that gold reflects the type of light we need to detect to understand the molecular universe. It's far beyond the human eyes can see. But it'll help us understand what each planet is made of. So here I'm gonna show you how that works. This is almost exactly the same water vapor bump I showed you before, high in the middle, uh, low on the sides. This is the entire extent of what the Hubble can see into the molecular universe. But the James Webb Space Telescope can see the entire handprint. You've got water in blue, methane in the middle, uh, carbon monoxide and dioxide, and ammonia. All of these are the major constituents of most of the atmospheres other than hydrogen and helium in our solar system. So if you want to understand our solar system, you want to detect these molecules from many planets. This is just one planet, but it's beautiful. This is the whole colorful palm print of this one hot Jupiter. In order to understand who we are, though, we need to, we need to have this colorful palm print for hundreds of planets. I'll show you in a minute. But that's going to take a long time. Here I'm showing you a distribution for the size of the planet and how long it takes to orbit its star. The big deal I want you to see here is that you've got Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter, and that there are a couple hundred purple and blue dots, but there are thousands of yellow dots. And that 80% of the planets in the universe are most likely Earth to Neptune size. So one to four times the size of the Earth. That's small in our category. That means that the diversity of atmospheres scales more from between Earth and Venus than it does between Jupiter and Neptune. So we need to understand the palm print for all of these dots. If we can just get a few hundred, we'd be very happy. It'll take a long time, though, because all of science is a long path through many squiggly lines. I kind of like this image because it kind of looks like itself a palm print. And the idea, like, it's kind of like on its side of the palm print there. But the whole global agenda is that when we look out into space, what we're really trying to find out is how we got here and much more importantly, how, where we are going to go as a species. Thank you.